Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I think we're about ready to get going. Uh, Rich, what do you say? Yeah, thank you guys for spending your evening with us. Uh, we're going to talk about our bag of tricks. You know, the more uh, Guy and I uh, do this, uh, the, the more tricks you get up your sleeve, so to speak. Don't you think, Guy, don't you think you're better at this now than you were 10 years ago? A absolutely. And, you know, it's things like this, I think, that will help you get through some of the hurdles of dental sleep. Uh, we got a lot to get through, so we're going to go pretty quick today. Uh, I'm the guy on the left, Dr. Guy Yatros. Rich there is my partner. We've been doing this quite a long time. Over uh, over two dozen years between us, and uh, we do a lot of dental sleep. That's all we do. Uh, we want to thank Keller uh, for helping promote this course. So we work with them a lot. Rich and I are uh, are wet-handed dental sleep dentist, uh, as well as uh, helping others implement dental sleep. And Keller's our, our lab that does a lot of our dental devices. You like this new device, Rich? They do Clear Dream. Absolutely. You know, we, uh, Guy and I got to be a part of the development of that in the early days. I think Guy actually got the very first one off the press, so to speak. And, uh, man, these things are tough. The price is right. Uh, they're very well made. Uh, you can see how uh, little uh, there is there, yet they're still strong. So we're going we're gonna to talk about that a little bit tonight. And we want to we wanna endorse Keller and uh, what they do uh, for that. Absolutely. And we're Dental Sleep Solutions. Uh, our mission statement is we are the most trusted, innovative, and customer-focused provider of solutions in ill sleep medicine. Whether it's billing, lab selection, home sleep testing, uh, software, we, we can help you with implementing your dental sleep. And if you have more questions, we'll give you our contact information at the end. So uh, I think we're just going to get started. we got a lot to get through. Let's get going. Yeah, yeah. we do. So there, there's what we hope to get through in this hour, which is pretty uh, uh I would say ambitious of us. So if we we get going, we can talk about it. I would say this is one of the biggest yeah, things. If you guys have questions, yeah, let me let me just tell them if they have questions, guy. You guys type those in there, and wh whichever one of us is not talking, we'll try to be uh, answering your questions as we go along. You can just type them in. It's probably the best way, and then we can verbally maybe answer some at the end. But I would say this is one of the biggest things. If you have to say, you know, the hurdles for dental sleep is is sometimes we 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 get some uh, jaw pain. Uh, and, and it can be on one side or it can be on both sides. And uh, the bilateral, sorry, I went one too far there. Uh, bilateral ch pain, I, I found, uh, is mostly to do with, with going too far and the newness and the stretching. And, and uh, uh, maybe uh, we've advanced it a little bit too much if it's on both sides. Yeah, I agree. So back, back up, slow down. You know, that's one of the things we talk about. Uh, you know, sometimes you tell people, hey, two or three half turns with a tap, for example, and they come back a week later and they've turned it 23 times, you know, and, but my jaw hurts, but, but man, I'm sleeping good, you know? Yeah. So there, there's those, you got to balance those, uh, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, moist teeth. We tell people take a washcloth, get it wet, put it in the microwave a little bit, you know, don't burn yourself. Let's just kind of hold it on your face, kind of like you're resting your chin in your hands. You just have moist teeth. And you, Kind of rub your your masseters and your jaw a little. Bit. Yep, and uh, I think Rich cut out for just a moment, but uh, I'll keep going in hopes that uh, his internet okay, catches. Can you hear me now? Yep, yeah, we cut out. He just, okay. uh, you know, physical therapy. Uh, you know, essentially, it, we've got a, a problem here with either the tissues in the joint or the muscle. Uh, I would say more commonly, it's the muscle than the joint itself, but it can be either one. And, and uh, you know, we, we, we need to slow down and, and possibly back up. And the NSAIDs are, are really big. I think putting someone on uh, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen three times a day for uh, a week or two with in addition to the other things here uh, can and let them know it's as a medicine uh, is it, good. And worst case scenario, we may have them discontinue this, the device for a period of time uh, and, and let these muscles uh, calm down. Uh, I, I talk to our patients about it's kind of like you maybe haven't been to the gym in a while and we're doing something new here and sometimes we got to give those muscles and tissues a break to let them rejuvenate and then we can go back to doing what we were doing are you picking on me for not being at the gym for a while <laughs> i didn't know you hadn't been at the gym in a while although i went this morning so uh you know uh you gotta 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 stay fit i guess but you know muscle pain i, I use that because you know, I've, I've done that at the gym where you pull the muscle and then you keep you keep going to the gym and you keep aggravating. And sometimes you just got to let it let it rest, and uh, and and that's what we have to do sometimes. And it can be in the muscle. Uh, I would again say the master is a big one, or or the the joints themselves. 
Yeah, and it can be painful and it can hurt. You know, I think, again, I think one of the reasons, Guy, that we are as successful at this as we are is we, we give patients a very realistic expectations at the outset. You know, we tell them, hey, this may make your jaw hurt. That's certainly within normal. You know, if you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, man, your jaw hurts, just take it out. You yeah. know, if they're severe sleep apneic and they have CPAP, we'll put your CPAP on. You know, you want to cover yourself. Be, be, be reasonable about that kind of stuff. But, you, you know, g give it a rest for a couple of days and then go back and wear it a little bit longer each night. You know, our goal really is that two or three weeks you're wearing this thing through the night and it's helping you. Absolutely. Right? A absolutely. And, you know, if um, <laughs> the CPAP standards are so, if they wear it about four nights a week, 70% of the night or so, they consider that successful. If we've got to take a few weeks to get these people adapted to it, uh, that that's fine. I mean, we're w working in the right direction. So uh, we can talk about those other things that we, we mentioned already, but decreasing the muscle function, if it's uh, if it's muscle, might might help be helpful. Uh, we can add a deprogrammer, which we'll show you some slides on that in just a moment uh, and, and why that might be effective. But now if it's the joint itself, we may want to do the opposite. We may want to balance the occlusion. Take That'll take some pressure off the joint. So if it's actually in the joint, uh, adding a deprogrammer, adding a, a stop in the anterior will actually put more force on the joint, uh, although it does uh, tend to decrease the muscle function. Out, uh, function uh, we've got to kind of know which one it is. So to determine if it's muscle or joint, and then we act appropriately. And uh, I don't do muscle relaxants that much. Uh, Rich uh, does it some, I think. We have a slide with which ones we might recommend for that in a minute. But uh, this is something, one of the reasons I do like dorsal-type devices, uh, it, it, it works well if you want to decrease muscle function. Uh, it, we know, if you don't know this already as, you, as your dentist and dental offices, if you, if you take a separator and you put it between your front teeth and clench as hard as you can, fill your master muscles. Now take it out and bite on the back teeth and fill the master muscles. You can see that the literally the amount we can clench with is decreased when our front teeth only hit, or in this case, a, a piece of acrylic. So if we have a device that hits all the way around and the person's getting muscle uh, tenderness and we've tried the other methods, uh, we might want to make it so it's just hitting in the front. Um, and do uh, you know how long it takes me to do this, Rich? I think you said about 10 or 15 minutes, right? No, about 10 or 15 seconds because all you do is you train your staff to do it once and then you can tell <laughs> them to do it the next time. And it, as long as it says, tells them to, to, to please put a deprogrammer on that, that's how long it takes you to do it. So if you're smart about it. Uh, you know, I do, yeah, I, I, you know, if we get new staff, we have to train them. But, you know, this is not something that – uh, that is beyond most of your team, and they'll enjoy knowing how to do this. And uh, we'll walk you through here first. You know, I use orthoacrylic. I just use the clear. I don't try to match whatever device is there. I don't know, Rich, do you have colors you use? But um, just uh, any kind of acrylic will work. Uh, I think the key there is if you don't rough it up, sometimes it doesn't stick well. So we rough it up, and I'll just buzz through these since these are slides I put in here, Rich, if you don't mind, and get, just get to the point. We rough it up a little bit. Uh, you get you a, a, a dabble of, uh, that's a Kentucky word, maybe a, a dollop of uh, of acrylic, uh, you know, kind of ro roll it up in your fingers. And then uh, I usually put a little monomer right on the acrylic. Looks like a chunk of catfish. Yeah, yeah. And, and you want to make this bigger than smaller, and I'll show you why in just a moment. But So you go ahead and put a little liquid monomer on there. Make sure you get a good bond. Uh, put a little liquid on it. Do not get it in the occlusal surfaces. I have uh, made every mistake that are is possible and uh, that's one of them you can do is you can get it over into the occlusal surfaces and now the device doesn't seat but you know form it to the best of your abilities uh, and the goal here is it's not going to touch in the back when we're finished so uh, at this point I use this pot right there in the middle uh, we 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 use it because it's it's just easy to use you can heat up some water and these little boil pots that we have and so we heat up some water as long as it's not a thermocryl type device. Uh, pour that completely full in the sink and then crank up the pressure to about 30 uh, in a few minutes when the acrylic's finished. And we just got to smooth it up. And, you know, I think you all can figure out how to do this without a complicated uh, explanation. But I do think it's important and when you do this or if your team does it for you that you look in there. And you, the purpose of this slide, if you look right in the back, you want it really close to hitting within maybe a half a millimeter or so. Uh, but not touching. If it's touching back there, if you didn't make it thick enough, you're, you're not going to get the desired effect of decreasing the muscle activity. So you want to have it as close as possible without, uh, without, without touching, uh, and you want to make sure they can go forward and backwards and it doesn't touch anywhere. And you can see the first time we put through, it was only hitting on one side of that little ramp. So we go ahead and, 
and adjust it out towards hitting pretty evenly and then smooth it up and and that's that now this person uh, it, it can really make a huge difference if they're having some sort of clenching muscle uh, activity that's causing them soreness uh, in the day so uh, what happens if their joints hurt and rich we want to do it something differently and I'll let you go through those slides okay uh uh, well, well, that the uh, the SUAD you can actually order with a deprogrammer. That was the the previous slide. So yeah. you, you guys, there are other devices that you can do that. So we like to support Keller and their webinar and what they're doing. But you can order those on some other devices. So, but yeah. uh, you know, again, uh, remember, muscle relaxants are only short term. Okay, I mean, I I think ten days is probably too long. You know, uh, flexural is one we use most often. It's just you know thirty tablets, well one tab, you know three times a day, something like that. At 10 milligrams, um, you can also use the Robaxin or the Soma. I mean, both of those are are good. Uh, uh, the Flexural is the cheapest, but uh, uh, you know, you guys, we'll we'll give you this slide if you want. You can look this up. It takes about, I'm going to say, 10 minutes to read about these. You know, online and make your own little cheat sheet. Uh, I know when I was doing general dentistry, guy, I, I had five or six uh, uh, three by five cards that had. You know, I only prescribe 20 medications, you know, right. you know, occasionally in my dental practice. And I just have my cheat sheets on there because, you know, sometimes we do this so infrequently we don't know. So uh, that is something you can use, but, but again, short term on that. And it uh, can have a negative effect uh, on the airway, your, can it? Or uh, would, would, wouldn't you surmise if they... A little bit, uh -huh. a little bit. You know, I mean, you're, you're relaxing the muscles, so, you know, don't overdo it. Again, yeah. these things are short term, that type of thing. So this kind of get people over those speed bumps, especially initially. I do want to add that occasionally, you know, we've, I have patients been in devices for 12 or 13 years now, and every three or four years, it's sometimes they go through a little spell for a week or two where their jaw really hurts, and, and they just quit wearing it for a little bit, or we might put them on this for a little bit, and I don't think it has anything to do, actually, with our dental device. I think it has to do with other things, but uh, remember that, that it's not always our dental device that's causing these problems as well. Good point. Good point. Now, if the joint's actually hurting, uh, you know, it's, it's 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 maybe getting loaded. If you do have a, uh, a a device that maybe has an anterior deprogrammer built in, something like a tap, uh, we we sometimes need to add these devices. And I'll let uh, Rich, you get to talk about this because it's your favorite material in the world, I think. So, uh, don't you use thermocryl or regular acrylic on this sometimes? Yeah, so. you guys. Uh, check out our latest Dental Sleep Medicine Insider magazine, and we've got a whole article in there on thermocryl and all kinds of stuff. But, you know, we're going to take a tap, for example. And like I said, we're only hitting in the front, and sometimes the joint can start to hurt. So we basically do the same thing as with the anterior programmer. You roughen it up. You put a little bit of uh, monomer, you know, on it. You make your yourself a little dollop on each side uh, you, you put that on and then and then uh, you know you mix it up and you put that on there uh, I know my staff guy when I teach him how to do this we take some ortho wax and we stick it on the inside you know we just kind of bond it to the or stick it in the inside so that that acrylic doesn't uh -huh. creep around and get inside uh, the appliance like you said and then you just kind of peel it out you know put it run it under real cold water or you know and, and then it, the wax just peels out but that's what we're going to do it's 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 we're just going to make a couple of posterior stops in the back we want to make them nice and uh, you know pretty and smooth remember the tongue sitting right there so uh, you, you know the other thing that uh, I want to say too guys when you put that thing in there the tap in there and you pull the cheek back look at how much room you have you know, don't don't do that twice. It's like that picture on the right. You wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to make a one millimeter uh, ball in the back there and then go, holy cow, we didn't put enough, right? Right. So, uh, but the difference between this is we're not letting this set up like we do with the anterior programmer, and then we we, we do that. You know, you know uh, this we're going to put some Vaseline on the top, you know, some kind of a lubricant, and then we put the bottom in, we put the top in. We after we hook the tap together, we just have them kind of move their jaw side to side, and, and that. That pretty much socks our occlusion in, so that now we're hitting in the in the front on on the tap plate, and we're hitting in both sides of the posterior at the same time. You can put some occlusal ribbon back there. You can see how they feel with that. Uh, so you're you're gonna put you're gonna roughen it. You're gonna put the monomer on. You're gonna put the uh, acrylic on there. The balls. You're gonna lubricate the top. You're gonna get them into you know 98% of the occlusion just right just by doing that. You put it in the pressure pot, and then you check it, and then you just kind of smooth up the sides. And now we're hitting in the front and the back left and the back right all at exactly the same time. 
Beautiful. And we call that tricotting. Yeah, and that's, again, for someone uh, maybe more of a joint problem as well. So uh, decreased muscle function, adding deprogrammers, adding posterior stops, muscle relaxants. Uh, th- these are uh, all of our, 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 our tricks. And in worst case scenario, we can back up the device or have them not wear the device for a bit. And, you know, even that's okay. I mean, uh, we shouldn't, uh, if they have a CPAP or something they can wear, if we take the de- uh, ask them not to wear the device for a, a period of time, that's a, a good idea. But uh, and, and just being patient. I think what Rich said at the beginning, uh, setting the expectation at the beginning that you may have some of these type things and not panicking when you have these type uh, of, of, of known side effects that we usually get get right on through. So TAP's come a long way, hasn't it, over the last uh, 12, 13, 14 years as far as uh, the, the ways we can uh, use them with the different hooks and the TAP3 and the TAP3 Elite and so forth? Yeah, the problem with me, you know, I kind of, I'm an old-fashioned guy, though, guy. I like the old tap ones because you never lost a key, you know, because it was glued to the front of it. Right. <laughs> now we, now we have, we're have we replacing these keys for the patients a lot. But, but yeah, they have come a long ways. They actually have different uh, hooks that you can put on now. And let, let's talk about a couple of different ways to uh, modify that particular device. Yeah, we can uh, back up that one, and I'm sorry I got these slides a little out of order, Rich, but uh, if you want to back up a tap, uh, you, we're going to show you how to do that in a minute. Again, uh, some other devices, just a little trick that I uh, came up with. Uh, if you have one of these male or female type devices like this one, then uh, you can just take a, and cut some of the female away. So maybe we've taken the bite uh, out too far, the person's having discomfort. Uh, we can just back it up by cutting the female portion out. Uh, on a, on a herps type device that has the male female uh, portion, uh, so that that that's a, that's a way we can do that with the uh, with the tap. Uh, again, um, it, it it becomes uh, uh, difficult uh, to do if you don't have the tap three elite. The tap three elite has a different hook. So um, again, we can uh, back those up by removing the hook, and we're going to show you how to do that. You can either go forward or backwards with that. Yeah, but you what what you you need to remember, you know, a patient's got a range of motion from zero to ten, and we we may start them, you know, uh, we hear people all the time, oh, you know, we want to bite at seventy five percent of protrusive. Well, in my opinion, you've gone too far probably half the time already yep. at seventy five percent. So I think that's too far. So we take bites at you know twenty, thirty, forty percent. We want forward but comfortable. So sometimes. We have to move the device back, like Guy just said, and sometimes we have to move it forward. So with dorsal, uh, we, we can do that by adding to the, uh, the, the back part of the wing itself that, that, that pushes uh, against the, uh, the upper adjustment part. And with the tap, I think we've got a few pictures in here. We, we have a picture of the other two. I didn't have any pictures for the dorsal, but you can also add to the to the smaller part on the top. But I've found you can just uh, add to the back of that wing, uh, and uh, it, it works quite well. So I, I totally agree with what Rich said, that more people will get in more trouble by going too far, too fast, too forward. And, and it's, let's be conservative about our bites. As a matter of fact, sometimes devices work better in, in, in a not as forward position as well. So being conservative is is fine. Sometimes we run out of adjustability and then we've got to do one of these, uh, uh, pull one of these things out of our bag of tricks and you could add to the distal of the dorsal. Uh, you can always send it back to the lab, but of course that takes time and effort and may cost some money. So changing the hook, the, the thing, uh, Rich likes the old tap. Uh, one maybe, or he still uses the, the, the Tap 3 uh, uh, with a smaller hook. The Tap 3 Elite now, which I use quite often because it is Medicare approved, uh, it, it has a uh, different size hooks that you could come with. And if you ask them to put the longer hook on, which you see in the bottom right of your screen, uh, and you know that maybe you need to go out further, then you can switch that out later and put the shorter hook on. Now you can do it the other way around, and you can have them mount it and put the shorter hook if you if you want to be aggressive and then have the ability to back it up. But I think we just established that you're really better off to to start it back. So you can see the difference in these two hooks. One one goes back further, and to change this is quite simple. Uh, it takes about you know five seconds to tell uh, Melissa to change this, but uh, <laughs> but you've got to show her the first time. Uh, <laughs> it takes Melissa uh, you know about five or six minutes to do this, and not, okay. you're going to show them how to move the tab mechanism itself and that takes uh, a little bit longer but you, what you need here is maybe a spoon you need the other hook and this wrench uh, in the middle comes with the uh, tap elite so 
uh, it just goes into the front and you just remove those two screws on the front of the Taf Elite. Uh, you can see, see me move, removing one here. The tight screws, not the, the center screw. Not the center screw. Thank you for the clarification. There's two. There's three screws. The, the center screw is the adjustment screw. So this little Allen wrench that comes with your Taf Elite uh, will will have uh, will fit those two side screws. Uh, now what I learned is you sometimes have to take an acrylic burr and kind of go around the front here because it, that plate may not pop off because the acrylic may be a little bit over it. So sometimes you need to do that, sometimes you don't. And then what I found is you get an old spoon down in here, uh, or you could use a knife, but the spoon seems to work real well and just get in there and pry, uh, pry that plate off, and it just comes off. And now you've got this, and you can take this little screw out that's here, and now you can put your longer or shorter hook on whichever direction you're going, and you put that back together, as you can see here, and then you slide it back into the slot and then put your screws back on. Uh, and again, you can do that to go forward or backwards, depending on whether you're going from the longer uh, hook to the shorter hook. And I really like that about the Tap Elite. It really makes it e uh, uh, easier. It sure makes it easy to change that. The, the, and what you're basically doing is increasing your range of motion by almost six millimeters by doing that. And, and you can do it that fast. And then that way we can be conservative about where we start and know that it's going to take just five minutes for someone to move that hook later if we run out of adjustability. So uh, the old-fashioned way here, uh, uh, we've done this many times as well. Uh, I'm sure Rich has done this more than me. Uh, so I'll let you talk about it if you actually want to move the whole mechanism itself. Yeah, occasionally you might have to do that. You know, if you have a patient that's in a TAP3, for example, and they don't, remember the TAP3 Elite, a hook doesn't doesn't work in the tap three, so you, you've got to change that whole maxway plate out if you want to do that. You can buy that part from them, and you can do that if you want. Uh, but then you got to have the big uh, train track bars on the bottom for Medicare, or at least one bar with the Elite. But you know, we just take the tap, we 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 mark the distal uh, the back edge of that. You can see the little. Uh, uh, Sharpie marks there, and then we just take a disc and we cut that plate out. It's just zip, zip, zip on three sides. Same thing. We take the old spoon or the uh, number seven wax spatula and, and uh, or, a, or a lab knife, something like that. We we stick it in the edge of that thing, and then we pop the plate off. So that's what uh, guys doing there. He's just kind of popping that plate off there, and uh, then you peel the uh, plastic, the suck down biocryl around it and stuff like that. You, you peel that off. Now we've got marks there where we were before, and now I'm going to just kind of smooth that up so it's nice and flat, and then I'm going to put a couple of retention grooves in there, a couple of little things like that, and then I'm going to salt and pepper that thing with acrylic uh, and, and, and let it get a little bit tacky, and then I'm going to take the maxillary plate itself and I'm going to put a little bit of monomer and, and uh, acrylic on that, and I'm going to turn it over and put it back on there in the same place, except that it's forward now. And we like to go in four millimeter chunks. So there you can see we've taken the acrylic, and we've got that, and now we're forward with that. And you let that thing sit there for about, you know, a minute, and you can move it around with your with your thumb. You know, it's you, you want to make sure the left, right, and the up, down. You don't want to make sure you're right in all three planes. So sometimes we kind of take a marker with a sharpie and we mark the midline as well, so it makes it easy to see. And then we just kind of, as that thing sets up, we just kind of push it a little bit, and then we add acrylic around the sides, and we add acrylic around the back, and we put it in our pressure pot for seven minutes, and then we. Uh, we take it out and we just trim it up, make it smooth. Right, and the key Be there careful. on the on the front where the lip is, make sure it's nice and smooth because that's where it can rub if you don't get enough acrylic out there to make it a nice smooth transition, right? Right, and the other thing is don't get acrylic on the threads of the uh, screw itself. Yeah. They we've, don't turn too well when no, you do that. No, we've, we've, we've done that as well. So uh, we, we see a few question, questions coming here. We're going to type the answers in between and, and get to them. So keep, keep them coming. We appreciate your input. But uh, uh, we're going to keep, keep moving, guys. Keep, keep we going. Got a lot more to go through. Yeah, so we, what happens when the device is too loose? And, you know, you know when this used to happen, uh, it might, you know, I'll send it back to the lab. You know, which that's one of the solutions I think we have on the slide here, and that, that certainly will work. But, boy, there's downtime. The patients don't want to be without their device. And uh, we've, we've developed a few little, you know, quick 
uh, tricks to that, uh, to, to, to make the device tighter. And sometimes it can make the difference between the whether a device is working properly or not. If it's not staying in the, in the mouth, if it's getting dislodged, it, it may not, not work. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons I do at times like ball clasp is you can adjust those. There's some negatives to the ball clasp with tooth movement and, uh, they they get loose over time, uh, and we'll we'll talk about each of these these ways of of of, of making it tight, and you know, uh, in addition to sending it back to lab. Hopefully, we don't have to do that as we become more and more creative. You can tell I like these old spoons, Rich. You know, this uh, I found a use for them finally after 25 years of practicing dentistry. I have a whole bunch of them laying around because I break them ever so often. But, you know, I don't use them. Uh, I don't do dentistry anymore. But even when I did, I didn't use them for decay removal. But, man, they work a lot of magic in certain ways. And it took me forever to figure out a way to tighten that ball clasp because, you know, you couldn't get a pliers behind it. A buffalo knife was too thick. And uh, use this little spoon just to get behind that clasp and just bend it in a little bit. Uh, that is uh, just a really quick trick that can save you time, and it makes it really easy to adjust ball class, which are nice because you can make them tighter. Uh, I do use the pliers to make them looser, uh, but if it's too loose and you got a ball class, then uh, you can just tighten it. The negative is it may only stay tight for, you know, six months. Those class tend to loosen over time. Any other tricks on that, Rich, that you have? No, that's perfect, perfect. And then as I got more creative, I did more of this. Have you done this a few times when they're when they're loose? Uh, I, I would say, Guy, that's probably our biggest challenge, you know, most days, is the pliance is too loose, you yeah. know, so we want to make it tighter. Uh, you got an EMA, for example. Uh, I, I love to do this with EMAs. This is one case where I do like a different color. You know, we talked about before, you know, matching the color or not. We do have a red uh, acrylic liquid that I love to use with EMAs, and we kind of line the inside of that EMA, and then we sprinkle the uh, – the, uh, uh, powder over that, and, and once we get it like a very, very thin layer, you know, a tenth of a millimeter kind of all through that thing, let it set up to where it gets kind of tacky, and then we, we you notice we've got these upper and lower apart now, you know, we don't have the, the EMA together here, okay. we just have them seat the lower and, and kind of hold it in. And we count to about 30, and then we have them barely tease it up about halfway off and push it back down. Count to 30 tease it up a little more, you know, three quarters of the way, push it back down. Uh, count to 30 again, tease it all the way off, and then put it in. And then when you, you turn it over, you know, now you, I can see where the uh, acrylic that we've added, we put it in the pressure pot again, and uh, we're, uh, we're done. You yeah. know, I mean, every now and then you have to buzz it a little bit because it's too tight now or something like that. So there's a little bit of a learning curve here. Here, you know, don't don't get a whole bunch of acrylic in there and tell the patient to bite in it and then go take a phone call. <laughs> no, you, know, you don't. Don't don't do that. <laughs> yeah, and you know, you can do this on devices. I never thought you could. Like, uh, say you've got a device that has a flexible material in there, and they get a new bridge or something like that, or it's just gotten loose. The flexible material's gotten worn out. Uh, you can take a burr in there and remove as much of that flex material as you can, and, and you can reline that. You can reline half of it. If one side's loose and the other isn't, right. I mean, you can just put it in on that one side. And uh, as Rich said, tease, the more you tease it in and out, the more it's going to uh, be uh, loose. The longer you leave it and set it up, the, the tighter it's going to be. And it, it does. there's a learning curve. And I typically do have my staff do this sometimes, although uh, this is something you definitely uh, want to make sure that you know what you're doing because you can get it locked on. But it can be flex material. It can be – I've even taken ones that have clasp and gotten rid of the clasp and just made it all hard acrylic and relined them. So uh, that was pretty much what I did for years until until my good friend and mentor here, Dr. Drake, taught me the – very scientific uh, heat and squeeze method, <laughs> which I feel like a you know like wow it's I plastic. should have thought Why of it's plastic. yeah you're like you kept telling me it's plastic just you know and 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 it seems so incredibly obvious to me now uh, and and maybe some of you all already know this and it's already obvious and I'm just a slow learner but uh, it, it, it's incredibly obvious now that sometimes you can just heat this acrylic up squeeze it and cool it back down and you'll constrict it and make it fit tighter and i tell you that's my that's what i always try first and you know what i'll bet um, the amount of relines i've done with ortho acrylic at least eight out of ten times it works it right? does and i was relining all those and this takes literally very very little time and you can do it with 
most any device, uh, you got to be careful. And you can use what I have here is more of a heat gun. It's just kind of, it's got a flame in there, but it blows hot air so it doesn't mar. In this case, uh, uh, I love that little thing. Yeah. That is a cool little tool. I'm glad you got me onto that. Yeah, it it it, it you know it doesn't make a black mark on the device because it's not not a flame. Uh, this actually, so you heat it up, and you can heat it with uh, this uh, with a torch with this a heat gun, uh, which you buy at like hobby shops, uh, and or you can heat it in uh, in boiling water and run it through boiling water for a minute, and then I usually have either some ice water there or some cold water nearby, and you just squeeze it. And then run it under the cold water. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, it cools it down. And then you put it back in the mouth. And is it tight enough? Well, a little tighter, not enough. What do you do? You do it again. And uh, like you said, eight out of ten times, uh, this will work even if it's a, a clear dream, if it's a, a an EMA. Uh, you gotta EMA, be, yeah. yeah. Even, the, even the taps with the, with the – Durasoft lining in them, all that stuff. Yeah. And you can do the reverse here too. You know, if you yep. if you squeeze too hard, you can take the patient's model. You can put some, you know, uh, Vaseline or some kind of lubricant on it, and you can get that thing hot and push it back down on the model, and it'll squeeze it back out. Yeah, or you can put it back in the mouth if you don't have the model. Just being careful not to have it too hot. You can put it back right. in, and it will stretch it back out. Yeah, like you said, the 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 flex materials. Uh, almost any device I've been able to, uh, at most times, be able to make it fit tighter. And this, uh, I probably one of the best tricks will uh, that that I've learned that saved me the most amount of time. Uh, so the heat and squeeze are great. And then uh, again, Rich, you 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 taught me about the Hilliard pliers, uh, uh, and I've used these on. Tons of EMAs. It's the best thing going for EMAs. Uh, but I've done it on dorsal designs, everything else here. I don't know what we have a picture of here. But you want to explain the – where would you find those? Yeah, the guy I was practicing with did a lot of uh, – Invisalign. Uh, what do you call that? Invisalign, yeah. And and he had those things laying around, and I was just – saw him sitting there one day. And, you know, one side's got a plunger on it, and the other side's kind of open. So you, you just heat the uh, plunger side of it, you know, with your little heat gun or whatever. And then you line it up interproximally, you know, right where you have room, and you're going to take the plunger on the outside of the device, and, and the other, the backstop of that, you know, is on the inside of the device, and you're just going to make a little dimple there, right? Just just push it in a little bit, and I'm, you know, it's easier to do just a little and try it in. Oh, not quite enough. Heat it up. Do a little bit more. And you can do that, you know, interproximately between the two molars, between the molar and the premolar, between the two premolars. It just depends on how much more retention you need. But it just puts a nice little dimple there uh, to make it tighter. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the dimple in this particular device, but it's uh, it, it definitely made a little bit more of an undercut in here. It's going to make a little hole on the outside, and you tell the patient you're going to do that. Uh, if you want to fill it back in, uh, you can. I usually just smooth it up. And like you said, I've done it in anterior areas, even in between the canine and the lateral. Sometimes you have to do it. Uh, and those pliers are uh, are the best thing going. Get the one with the red. I don't know if uh, I can back it up real quick. But the the one with the red, because uh, I didn't, I made the mistake of getting the wrong ones the first time. And the uh, if you look at the, because uh, they come in a couple of different yeah, sizes. Yeah, so see, it's got a little red, red red band on it there. It, it, it's for undercuts. The other ones are from tooth movement, so I bought the wrong ones to start with. So and they are about a hundred something dollars, but man, what way well, well worth it. So uh, again, I, I have to say this is probably the. The one section where I used to go, gosh, this is, I need this device to be tighter, and I spent a lot of time sending stuff back, relining. Uh, we've got uh, you know all kinds of options here for you uh, to, to to get the devices tighter. Very good, uh, nice but, nice review, guy. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the elastics that you can add, okay? Because sometimes you know patients will wear a device if we put them in a dorsal, for example. And in their jaw, you, you know, it's just not working as well as we want it to. Or my mouth gets really dry, you know, after that first couple of weeks. So there are ways that you, you know, some of the devices we can order with hooks on them. Uh, some of them you can put little grooves in and you can put elastics on and things like that. So uh, as a general rule, adding elastics to any of these devices usually makes them work a little bit better. Wouldn't you say that's true, Guy? Yeah, I don't think it ever, uh, rarely if ever, makes the devices not work as well. So any device that allow your jaw to open, whether it's a dorsal design, whether it's a herps, 
uh, it, 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 if, if the jaw can open, then I think it has the potential of not working as well if the jaw opens too much. And so we always want to try to have a way to hook them, but sometimes we don't think of that ahead of time. And uh, and you can uh, on devices that are strong enough, and the, the new Clear Dream uh, really is great. I don't have photos of it, and I apologize about that. But their their acrylic is so hard that you don't have to have hooks, and you can make these similar type grooves uh, in it if you don't if you don't have the hooks on it. So you just get a burr, and if you ask uh, Keller, they'll put these in there for you uh at, i don't think at any extra charge uh and you just get a place to put grooves and on the dorsal we put them in a little different spot but i used a, a diamond burr here you can use a disc you know smooth up everything after you've done that and it's pretty pretty simple and then now we have a place to put the rubber bands so this person's uh not opening and, and i can tell you you can go from a device not working well still snoring if you sleep test them maybe they're still having a significant apnea to working uh, way better uh, when you have something that helps keep their mouth more shut. Uh, what happens here? Well, now we got to go back to the previous slide sometimes because what's going to happen is this device may not be tight enough, but that's okay. We've got a solution for that. We may need to do one of our other methods if we add elastics because it could start the device to, to start uh, uh, dislodging. So adding elastics is uh, really you got to have that in your bag of tricks if you want devices that allow opening uh, to be predictable, because uh, without the ability to add elastics on any of them, uh, you you may not have a, a predictable case in in all situations. Yeah. So uh, again, remember these are great things to have in your back pocket to pull out to make uh, to make our patients' uh, treatment more successful. Uh, we had a guy come in, guy, and and he said, "Man, you know how many turns are you at? Well, I said like 12, but it seems like every morning I wake up, you know, my wife, you, you know, about five o'clock in the morning, my wife's going, "Hey, you're snoring again, you're snoring again," and, and I wake up and my 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 screws back to zero, you know, I can't figure it out, you, you know, what what we're doing, and uh, you know, sometimes that center screw in the tap, uh, it, especially I've seen this a lot with real big guys, you know, 400 pound guys with big old strong jaws. And they just put so much pressure on that thing that I think they wear those 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 grooves out in in that thing. And uh, I, I think sometimes that that hook actually starts to jump over those uh, threads on that particular uh, center screw. Yeah, and and I, the first few times that happened to me, I thought you know the patients uh, they they thought they had a screw loose because I thought they were you know uh, you know <laughs> come on you're you're you know you're not doing this correctly. Uh, I thought they were turning it the wrong way, but it does happen on occasion. Uh, one trick, I don't know if you've tried this, and I don't have this uh, instrument anymore now that I sold my dental office, but I found this to work on occasion. I took a, the old uh, micro etcher I had uh, for crowns, and, mm -hmm. and I just etched the heck out of the screw and moved it forward. And it just, I think if it was stripped out, what it did there is it made it, you know, kind of more um, difficult to turn the screw, and it, and it, and it, it seemed to help on some some of the patients uh while well, now it's not backing up or jumping over the screws or whatever exactly is going on there uh have you, you you've done this before another right? use for thermocryl right <laughs> yeah you just you just get them to 18 turns wherever you want them and then you just heat up a little piece of thermocryl and you just push it down in to the back side of that screw so that the screw can't back up yeah and you could use regular acrylic but i like the thermocryl because if you ever want to remove it you just heat you it. Just pour a little hot water over it and pop it out. Yeah, pop it out. So it's completely reversible, and uh, that's typically what I do. Uh, but um, you know, uh, sometimes that screw's just maybe gotten stripped, and uh, they've always been pretty good. If you call the lab, uh, they, they can usually get you another screw for little to nothing uh, to replace it. Uh, you know, as long as you're not calling them up every week with this problem, which you won't have the problem every week because it it doesn't happen that often. Uh, you know, just replacing a screw might be. Uh, what's indicated on that. Thank you guys for your questions too. Hopefully we're getting to most of them as we get through here. Uh, I type faster and Guy talks faster, so <laughs> okay. I'm going to try to be answering most of your questions. And uh, hopefully you guys are getting something out of this. Yeah. Again, thank you for spending your evening with us. Yeah, I think we're doing pretty well on the time here. Uh, we had a lot of slides, but we're, we're getting there. So, uh, you know, when a device breaks, um, I found, uh, uh, you know, on a herps or a dorsal design, sometimes adding a deprogrammer can help because it decreases muscle function. 
Uh, other things we can do is add reinforcement, uh, you know, meshes and, and, and things like that uh, we, we can do. And then, you know, we can always uh, switch devices. And, I, you know, I, I don't think I ever switch devices based on, uh, well, this one's not working for the patient. Because, you know, I've tried that, and, and they all seem to work pretty much in the same ballpark. But I have made the mistake of not getting a big-time Bruxer, and uh, certain devices hold up a little better. Rich and I have in our, in our, in our DS3 software have a device selector, and one of the things we have in there is Bruxism. And for the big-time Bruxers, uh, you know, we, we sometimes select uh, uh, devices that maybe the tap holds up a little better than the EMA. Uh, the new ClearDream uh, dorsal is really one of the strongest dorsals, but, uh, you know, I, and I haven't had uh, any breakage of it, but the, you know, it, it has uh, the physics there. Uh, they can put a lot of force on those attachments. So uh, th- th- there's some, some options for you. Uh, and sometimes, depending on the device, I don't have a slide on it, but if you, uh, uh, sometimes the way the mechanisms are, if they're fully advanced, they put more pressure and sometimes repositioning the advancement get, mechanisms. Get more well. torque on one thing or the other. Right. Can, can I add one thing there? Absolutely. The it, it would be simply how they hold the device when they clean it. Oh, that's a good point. Really you know, we, used to, we used to get people with EMAs, and they'd always crack in right in the middle. Yep. We go, what the heck's going on? Well, show me how you hold it when you brush it. And they're holding the, the you know both of the posterior sides, and as they brush hard, they squeeze hard. And they're just squeezing that thing together, you know, while they clean it. So that would be the only thing I'd add. And, and that reminds me of, a, of the last thing, which is similar, is how they take it in and out. Uh, right. You know, uh, if they're pulling on the EMA on the buttons, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a possible that the buttons will come off. They can, you know, on the on the Clear Dream, we don't recommend they pull the uh, advancement block in the back. That's the easiest place to grab, but that's not really always the best place to pull on. So, uh, yeah, how they uh, put the device in and take it out is important as well. So, And then the last thing we're going to go with is, uh, you know, uh, I think this is actually in our Dental Sleep Medicine Insider magazine that's coming up, uh, which I don't think I put a slide in for. I just now realized I forgot to do that. But uh, you know, if you want to uh, get a copy of that, let us know. We're, we're doing that every other month now. And, and we actually have videos because it's a digital magazine. So uh, some of these slides will, it will be in there as well as uh, lots of other information, including Rich's um, a really good article on thermocryl. It's not only uh, in, uh, funny, but it's very, uh, <laughs> it's very uh, much in, 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 as far as gaining knowledge goes. But, uh, you know, this used to scare me. Rich, did you, you know, patients had no upper teeth. Uh, and, it still uh, scares me, guys. I love doing this. This is one of my favorite things to do, and my staff uh, does most of this again. It doesn't take much more of my time now, and it's just a, I don't know, it's just a neat procedure that we thought we'd throw into the bag of tricks. So, you know, if someone has an upper denture, now they need to have lower teeth. I've not been able to successfully do a, a mandibular advancement device on someone with no lower teeth. Uh, or no lower implants. They have implants. We can certainly utilize the implants. But uh, uh, you know, no no lower teeth. Um, we're in trouble. But if they have a, enough lower teeth, but they have an upper denture, which we see quite often, uh, this is a great technique. And I, I ideally want the denture to fit fairly well. It doesn't have to be perfect, but uh, if it's a horribly fitting denture, then maybe this may not be great. Or if they have a horrible ridge, you may want to reconsider it. But uh, for someone who has a, a fairly decent ridge and a fairly decent denture, then uh, you need to get out and, and purchase one of these denture duplicators. And uh, uh, this was something uh, I had for my crown and bridge practice, and, and I've used this thing. I probably do one of these a month. Uh, you, you get the denture duplicator, and... Um, you're basically going to make a duplication of their denture. Uh, we recommend alginate in this because if you use polyvinyl for this part, it would cost $150 probably. So uh, you need about five, four or five scoops of alginate. Make it kind of runny. You 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 put it in half of the denture duplicator and then you push down on the on the denture. And you can you can vibrate it uh, on a vibrator slightly if you want to at that time, and then you let it harden. Uh, uh, once it's hardened, uh, the alginate set rather, then you want to vaseline the alginate so that the two alginates don't uh, don't bond together. So you can put it on the denture, but the main thing here is to to keep the alginates from uh, adhering. And then you fill up the other half, again four or five scoops of alginate, and then you squeeze it all together, and then uh, t- tighten that little knob that's on the top, and. Uh, You've got a mold of your denture, so you you take the denture out, and if you've got a few voids here and there, don't stress out about it because we're gonna gonna reline this anyway, uh, and then we're gonna take uh, 
uh, some uh, again I like the clear ortho acrylic and for this one you do want more clear because it's better you can see through it uh, you can see if it's impinging the tissues or anything anywhere uh, so we take their ortho acrylic you're gonna need quite a bit so you see I got a pretty sizable rubber bowl because we're gonna make basically a clear denture make it somewhat runny uh, put it into the mold uh, you may want to vibrate it on a, on a vibrator try to get as much air bubbles out as you can and now you're going to squeeze the whole thing together again and tighten that screw down as tight as you as you can get it. And now you make sure you get the excess acrylic off here because it'll lock everything together if not. So uh, while it's in kind of the doughy sage, get the excess acrylic off. And then I usually have a little piece of that laying around so I can tell when it's hard. And once it's hard, then we take it apart and you have a clear denture. Now again, this is going to take about 30 minutes to 45 minutes extra time and you may want to charge a little bit more for this but you can be your staff time my staff knows how to do this now so I don't uh, have to do this part the patient's just reading a magazine uh, you know or in the room uh, waiting while we uh, are duplicating their denture uh, you're going to smooth up that fin of the junction between the two molds okay and then key if you've relined a denture in the past make sure you know that you need to un knock out the undercuts because if you don't do that the the, the, when they pour up the model at the lab, they will it'll lock on, and uh, you 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 get the undercuts out, and then we have a duplicate denture. So we're going to try this in the patient's mouth, uh, and oftentimes their denture may not fit great, and you can see this denture was overextended. Uh, so if the patient pulls their lip down, it's going to pop it loose. So we're going to go in and trim the borders so that it's not overextended. Uh, you can border mold it if you want and put a post dam in. Uh, this one had a good post dam, so I didn't. Uh, we put a couple, three holes in here with an eight-round burr uh, for retention and then paint it with our adhesive, making sure we get it wrapped around the buckle, just like you're going to see. are basically going to reline this denture with a, a, uh, a, a thin wash of light body material. Uh, and then we have them gently bite down, and the occlusion is not critical, just as long as it's seated gently into the mouth and we border mold. Uh, and that part I do do myself, and then we trim it up, and we've got a nice Im impression of the of the teeth. And then from here on, we just treat it just like a normal teeth. We're going to put that in the mouth, and you use your George gauge, take your bite, you know, like Rich said, 30, 40, 50 percent, whatever you're comfortable with this patient. And then there's really two devices that work well with this. Uh, I've been doing quite a few more herps because they're Medicare approved, and it worked quite well. My choice is the dorsal design, and uh, you know, if you need help with this, certain labs uh, uh, need instruction, and we can help you with uh, with that. But uh, here you go, and you can see this does have the hooks for the elastics. Oftentimes, you can't use those because uh, if the retention is not really, really great. But on this particular case, this patient was able to wear those with the elastic. And in closing, we'll talk about why this is an ad advantageous over making it to the denture. And I've discussed this with other dental sleep dentists, and they actually make it to the denture. The problem with that is. There's going to be a lot of force in a uh, posterior direction on this, as you can see. Can you imagine that wings are catching? It's going to maybe cause sore spots up in the anterior buccal vestibule. And what are you going to need to do to fix that? Well, you may need to adjust the flange. If you adjust the flange on the person's denture, it'll cause it to possibly not fit as well. And I don't like that. I like the idea of here, any adjustments I'm making, I'm not you know, adjusting it to a, to a denture. That uh, So... Uh, I think that's it for the bag of tricks. So we're actually going to get get completed. Uh, uh, close to on time. I know we're answering. Are we some on questions. time? Yes, we are. We're uh, about 50 minutes in here. So uh, I, I, that, there's a lot of slides, but we got got through them. And I uh, hope this has been uh, advantageous to you. You know, uh, if 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 we can help you in any way, that's what we do. We have a full time team that all we're, we're focused on is dental sleep implementation. Uh, everything from uh, insurance billing to devices, to, uh, working with your Keller Lab to, to, to um, uh, how we manage our, our EMR. Uh, and if you want to see our services, we'll, we're, you can try us out for three weeks free. Uh, you can try our, our web-based software. I'll leave that up for a minute. I mean, I, I really don't know, Rich, of anybody else that does what we do. We, we pretty much... Uh, a to Z helped Dennis do this. Well, that's how we started this seven years ago. So we've invested all our time and effort and money. Uh, I sent guy a text the other day. I want my whole life back. He said he fell off the toilet. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's what we do. We we help people do this, and and we love working with people like Keller. 
Uh, we're, we'll uh, if we can if we can get that other slide in there somehow, we'll try to get that slide in there about the uh, uh, the other webinars that we have coming yeah. up and what have you. There's and, the next one. Uh, yeah, there's the next one, and we're gonna we're gonna talk. Uh, I think I got now, guy, about uh, 60 hours reading on Bruxism and OSA and that kind of stuff. So. Uh, I, I think we're going to open your eyes with some things that maybe you hadn't thought about before. So uh, uh, if you're making night guards, uh, this is definitely something you want to tune into, especially as you get more in tune with sleep. Absolutely. And also we'll mention, uh, sorry for the slide flipping, we do have some hands-on course that we're doing with Keller. Uh, there's one coming up pretty soon. Uh, so uh, that one, I guess, actually is going to be over by the time uh but i guess it is over and so the, that's uh, rich is doing that one so i forgot that's uh already been passed yeah, that, and we that, have that went that went very well and 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 you know we're we're devoted to, to getting dennis uh teaching you and your staff how to do this yeah that's the bottom line that's the bottom line if you want to come to one of our hands-on courses let us know uh here's our contact information we're going to continue to type in some answers here and stay on for a, a few more minutes to do that uh it's it's just if we open up the mics we found with the, we've got a really big group tonight and uh it, it becomes unwieldy so just keep your answers coming and we'll we'll try to answer them thanks a lot for joining in and uh let's let's see if we can get to some answers here rich thank you guys have a good evening